I'm gonna do sort of a follow-up to the previous talk. Uh, this is gonna be functional. Uh, I have my, uh, let's call it a presentation for the sake of the argument, in 10 slides, uh, which are 10 uh, different files. And I'm gonna show you how to take uh, the classic JavaScript array methods and make them more functional. Sound, sounds interesting? Yeah? All right. So. To talk about functional programming, we have to talk about things that are not functional. So let's take uh, uh, a classic example. And you'll see that we use the same example in every single thing. So we have an array of 10 numbers. Uh, in this case, we have to say, OK, an output array is going to be uh, an empty one. And then what we want to do is to take every single thing in that array and double it. So back in the days, uh, in my case, it was actually days before I actually knew how to code, we had to do for loops. So you had to say from uh, for, we have to define the variable that we use for that, then it has to be smaller than this, and it has to go up, and it's just so much, so many things to write. Then you have to say, okay, we have to have that output array defined, and uh, then we have to push something into it, and then we have to ask for that input array on that specific, nah, nah. OK, same thing if you want to filter for something. Let's say that we have the array of 10 numbers, and we only want to get the even ones. Same thing, but in this case, we have a predicate. If the modulo, this is a bit of math, but it basically returns the even numbers. OK, but these days, we can do it a bit smarter. We have the array methods. So we can take the input array, and we can call a map function on it. And what a map function does is it takes the item in that array, one by one, every single piece of that array, and does something to it. In this case, it returns times 2. So if I try running this one, it gives me the array times 2. Can you see these small numbers in the back? Yeah? Because there's actually no way to make those, uh, that font bigger. Uh, all right, same thing uh, if we want to filter something. We have a, function, uh, we have a method on, uh, on the array prototype called filter, and it takes a function that returns the element into the output array if it meets the predicate. Pretty simple. What I love the most about this is that it's so semantic. Just compare this code. The fuck I know what's that happening at first glance? In this case, I even have the word filter highlighted. Isn't that amazing? Now imagine if you're reading something very complex and you have nested loops and, and everything. It just turns into a mess. All right. Say again. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, let's take it a bit further, and let's say that we want to do multiple things at once. So we want to take the input array. We want to take only the even ones. Then we want to multiply them by two, and then we want to return only the ones that are less than ten. In this case. This is going to return 4 and 8. Now, this is where the first problem with these things start. These are very easy to read, but if you imagine that you're dealing with a shit ton of data, and you're dealing with something very computational heavy, then you're going to start in running into problems. Because what actually is happening in, uh, in this case is that after every operation, we create a new array, we put every single thing in it, and then we take that array and we process the next one. And I found this amazing illustration of it, which is sort of off. So this is what's happening. One piece after another through every single operation. So these bits are the operations that we want to do, and the array items are moving through them. 
Now, this is not really something we want because we're only interested in the outcome here. We don't really care for these arrays in the middle. And if you're dealing with something that's memory heavy, then you're going to start running into issues. Because what you actually want, and it is actually cached, because what you want is you want to have that item go through every single operation you want to have done on it and end up in the array. This is amazing illustration. This is just so much more efficient. Now, you probably don't run into issues like this when you're running something on the client. But let's say that you're running uh, your backend in JavaScript and you're dealing with a lot of data. You might want to think about these things. So in order to make this thing even more functional, we have to understand a bit how these things actually work. So we've talked about two uh, methods on the prototype. We have the filter and we have the map. We also have a third one, which is called reduce. Now, reduce is a bit of a mindfuck to, to understand. I remember struggling with it uh, since my very first days of seeing it. And I wouldn't still say I fully understand it. Thank you very much for having me giving the talk. <laughs> so what reduce does is it takes two items. It takes the accumulator, which I think is a terrible name. I like calling it the current value. Like This is what we have in this current iteration of going through the array. And then we have the item, the current one that we're dealing with. And in this case, hey, so have a look at the same thing we did before, mapping it uh, to the twice the value in, uh, in the array. So in this case, we can be a bit smart because uh, I run a modern node. And we can say, OK, return me an array, uh, return into uh, uh, the array everything that is in the accumulator, everything from the previous values. This is what these three dots do. If you don't know them, highly recommend it. It's called the spread syntax. And it saves so much typing. And then uh, we just say, hey, uh, after all of these items, do the item times two. Another important thing for reducing, uh, you need to say what we want to reduce into. So in this case, since we want to get an array back, we have to say you start with an empty array. And the same thing, if you run this, we get all of the numbers multiplied. OK. Same thing for filtering. In this case, we only return the item into the accumulator if it meets what we want it to meet. If not, we just return what's currently in and we move to the next part of the array. Make sense? Because this was the easy part. Now, let's talk about abstracting the reducing uh, the reducers a bit. So we have seen two operations, one for mapping, which takes a function, yeah, I have to go up, which takes a function, which does some sort of a transformation. In our case, it was multiply the item by two. And it takes a reducing function, which our case was the add it into the array. But what you can do with reducers are many other things. You can say that I want to get the sum of all of these things in the array. For the sake of this presentation, let's just say that we want to get the array back with some sort of a transformation. Now, then we take the accumulator and the item again. You've seen this with the, with the reducer uh, signature. And then we return the reducer. And this is one of the first mind mind fucks fucks, I might say, because they sort of reduce on, on themselves. And in there, we, we say, uh, call it with the accumulator and transform each of the items. Now, what this does is the map you've seen before. With one difference, we can say that we want we, the, redu the reducing function can be whatever we want it to be. And this is something that's going to come in handy a bit later. Now, same thing for filtering. These helpers only take the reducing function out of that reducing function. Now, 
This allows us to do something like this. If we want to do the map, if you remember, we can just say, hey, reduce it with doing the mapping with this accumulation. So in this case, it's very easy to use this function signature to say, hey, I want to map everything and then reduce it differently, not by adding into, into an array, but let's say summing it. Does it make sense? Do you see the difference? Yeah, I thought this is going to be the difficult slide. So if we try running this, it produces the same thing, just written slightly differently, because we've abstracted some parts of the things that are written in it out. It still returns double everything that's in the original array. Now we can do the same thing for the filtering. So if you run this, it only gives us the even ones. Same thing, just like you get it out of the browser, modern browser. But this is where the interesting part comes in. Because what a reducer is, it takes the accumulator and the current value and it returns the output. The current state with the input is the output, which means that we can say the mapping will do the filtering and then this will return whatever we want it to return. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So if you run this, we get the same thing. Multiply everything and then return all of the even ones, which in this case, everything's even if you multiply it by two. But this is important because this would be already called a transducer because it's doing, because of the reduction, it's doing these two operations at once. In this case, there is no intermediate array created. Remember this one? We are already doing this. We're not doing this. Where was uh, the previous one? We're not doing this. We're doing this. The problem is, this is terrible to read. And imagine if you have multiple ones and you want to do 10 operations. If you've ever been in the callback hell in JavaScript, this is sort of similar, similar idea of it. So what we, ha what we have to do is we have to figure out how to, and this is gonna sound funny, how to reduce these things through a reducer. Is the one still around? Thank you. So we have to reduce these through a reducer to make them more readable. Which brings me to this slide. So we have the same helpers we had before, the mapping and the filtering. They just got a bit shorter because you can write things a bit more terse. And we have a new one. And there are two returns in that function. I'm not going to go in depth in how composing functions work. The important thing we need to know for this example is that compose works backwards. So in this example, we were saying first filter, then map, and then filter. When are we doing composing, we have to do it backwards. Or we, ha we don't have to do it, we have to write it backwards. If you're interested in why, I think you would be the perfect person to ask. All right, so let's make it a bit more easy to, to read. So we take this thing called transform, X form, because it's shorter to write. And we take uh, the output would be the reduce of the transform, because we already have it figured out, we already have it defined through the compose function. And then we do the same thing. Take the, uh, take the accumulator, uh, take the item, and return whatever's in them. Now, if I have everything uh, properly commented out, uh, the output is wrong somewhere. Output is not defined. Should be now. Yes. So we get the same output. Now, again, this is the journey to understand how it works. So my last slide is the miracle that happened. 
So we have all of the helpers we had before, again written in a terse way. And now we add a new one, which is finally called transduce, because this talk about transducers. And the signature of the transducer is that we take the transform, the reducing function, the initial thing that we want to uh, transduce, reduce into. Do you get the idea? Transform and reduce, transduce. It's a great pun. And uh, the input, whatever uh, we have to give it. Uh, I sort of don't like uh, taking the input as the last uh, one, but this is the way it's done in functional things. And then uh, again, it returns the input, reduced through this and that. Uh, if you have any questions about this, probably ask me after, because I would have to go through all of those slides again. But ultimately, what it allows us is say, OK, so the transform we want to do is the same one we did in the chaining method. So you, you had filter, and on top of that, you had the map, and on top of that, you had the filter. In this case, we compose. We compose written upside down, in this case. And the output, we have full control over it. So we can say, hey, uh, we, ha we want to have this transformation. We want to have this reduction. And again, this could be summing or any, any other reduction you can do. We want to do it into an empty array, and we want to do it on this. And if I run this, and this fails, it doesn't. So it gives me those four and eight, all of, these, all of the doubles of the array that are less than 10. Now, the reason I'm telling this, uh, this was the last slide, the reason I'm telling this is if you don't care about why it's doing it, if you don't care about anything between, say, 2 and 10, you don't have to. There are libraries that do this. If you like black boxes, if you like to get the output, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. I like to dig in, and I like to understand why it's happening. And I think it's fascinating. That's it. Any questions? <laughs>